This is the Powered Up Podcast, show 31. Remember, one child makes all the difference in the world to one family. And even if we have a 93% success rate, what we need to do is we need to follow up to get that 7% success rate with that one student. Welcome to a real world education with insight and advice from teachers in the game, where current and former educators reveal what truly sets apart the great teachers and what it takes to make a positive impact on students. Whether you're in pre-service learning, new to the game, or a seasoned veteran, this is the show for you. You'll leave feeling inspired to take action because we are powering education by empowering you. What's up, everyone? This is Ken Herman, host of the Powered Up Podcast, and I'm here with my co-host, as always, Mr. Matt, always powers me up, Rogers. Matt, what is going on? Ken, honestly, I don't know if you could have had a better introduction. I feel honored. And honestly, that's speaking about today in this conversation, That that's kind of who I aim to be. Power everyone up. I know you do the same. Like, is there a better compliment? I don't know. I'm doing very, very well. How are you? I'm doing well. I I agree. And and normally I'm very nice with all of my my nicknames for you. But today I just wanted to be a little bit extra nice. Just like Tim Taylor was always very nice to Al Borland. (laughs) I I do the same for you. You need to start wearing flannel for me once in a while so I can I can wrap that into your nicknames. So I got plenty of that in the closet. Don't worry. <laughs> we had a we had a really interesting conversation tonight with our our guest. His name is uh, Casey Jakubowski from New York, and he's had a he's he's been on many different journeys through through his education career, and is very very open, honest, and authentic with us, and is really passionate about supporting teachers and preventing burnout, and so. Matt, I'll, I'll give you two options. Either share something that you want about the interview, or if you feel comfortable, is there any type of burnout moment that you had that you felt you needed support and you got it, or anything that you want to add to that conversation? Oof. Um, first off, I loved the conversation, and I felt like it, it covered some topics that we often shy away from. We're scared to have the real conversation um, in in kind of the, the fear that it will be taken the wrong way or what is frustration talking in the place of actual feeling um, because we get frustrated in our, our day-to-day life. And I get frustrated with my wife, with my dogs. That happens, but that's not how I truly feel. It's just what's coming over me at that time. I think honestly what what happened when I felt the beginnings of burnout because it's something everyone feels is I changed positions and it kind of created a new lease on life of what I was doing and I got to look from a different lens and and I've documented this on the podcast before I I taught special ed for 5 years and loved teaching special ed but felt like I wanted to make more impact on more kids and so jumping into uh, regular ed where I was teaching all the subject areas kind of really reignited the flame and to be honest probably two or two years ago um, Ken and I we were both doing a lot of speaking pre-pandemic Um, having opportunities to do conferences and all these different things. And I was really feeling burnt out. And I actually took some of the advice that we'll talk about later in the episode to just step back and, and reprioritize. And I cannot tell you enough, Ken, like I'm going into year eight in the same grade level and I would be willing to try a new grade level, but I also finally feel like I can appreciate what I'm doing and not being bored of repeating it 
just looking at how I can refine and um, have a grasp of what I'm teaching and utilize that to push to high level teaching. So I'm, I'm really encouraged. Um, but if I stayed in the same position, um, now part of that was I moved buildings and I, I moved from one great building to another great building. It wasn't like uh, I upgraded or downgraded, but the move, the whole new set of kids that I need to get integrated with, the brand new position, the new curriculum, all the and responsibilities really didn't give me enough time to feel that five-year burnout. I would say that I felt a 10-year burnout though. It's important. What I, what I appreciated about the conversation, and, and honestly, you and I had no idea it was going to go that route. We knew about Casey through, you know, informal introductions and just learning about each other. I wasn't aware of how passionate he was about that topic. And it got me thinking even between the interview and, and us recording this introduction now and, and just what you were saying there. I don't know that I would ever say I felt burnout, but I felt the desire for change. And, mm. you know, I think if you're feeling that way, you got to look in first and then look out. Look in first to see, is there things that you need to do differently? Is there things that you need to do differently personally to remove yourself from work? So you're turning work off and you're turning personal life on. Those types of things. We've had a lot of guests talk about, you know, sharpening the ax and taking care of yourself. But then look out, you know. Is it, is it a change in grade level if you're elementary? Is it a change in course if you're secondary? Is it a change in school, staying in the same district so you're not you know, taking that big risk of applying for new jobs and that type of stuff? Uh, when, I was, when I was in like year five or six teaching fifth grade, I had the opportunity where I was, there was an opportunity to apply to be a technology coach. And a lot of people felt that I was very well suited for the position. And I was highly considering applying to it. And looking back on it, I was not, I didn't need a change, but I saw it as a good opportunity for myself. And I ultimately ended up not applying for it because the position started in January, because that's when the previous person was leaving, instead of starting what I thought would be September, the beginning of the year. And I never even applied because I refused to walk out on my classroom in the middle of the year. And I made that decision in September when the first day of school started and I was in the classroom. And I didn't know when that position was going to open up, but I made the decision then. That ended up being the best year ever for me. I grew the most that year. It's the year that uh, all of the homeroom parents nominated me for teacher of the year, which started that process for me. And it changed my career. And so I'm so thankful that I didn't go for that. And I think when you're looking at, are you burnout? Do you just need small changes? Do you need to change positions? Really think about it and think about it wholly before you just make brash decisions in moving grade levels, moving buildings, moving positions, because the grass isn't always greener. It might be some simple things that you can do instructionally it might be some simple things that you can lean on others casey talks a lot about leaning on others and so it's it's just a very raw authentic conversation that i think will connect with a lot that felt it at one time maybe they're feeling it now or keep it in the back of their head for when they will feel it at some point and so absolutely anything you want to add before we uh we jump into that interview yeah the only thing i would add is just that that element of whether you're a new teacher or I've felt burnout over and over again, I think one of the benefits that I've found is uh, you were talking about sharpening the ax. When you do get to that point and everyone is through this podcast has really preached the idea of, well, lean into what your identity is outside of school to give you comfort and safety and, and satisfaction that is one of the benefits of growing in a grade level or growing in a position that uh, as long as you can separate yourself from guilt of not working as hard, it's not that you aren't working as hard. You just have put in the work to be able to look at other attributes. And I think that's a huge thing to consider. But I think you also hit it 
right too i had the same situation not to elongate our opening i had the same situation i went in for an interview uh the second year that i was teaching fourth grade and the last question was essentially why should you hire me uh like why should i be the hire person hired for this position and at that point 11 out of question 12 questions i took very seriously and not that i didn't take this question seriously but i identified that through this interview i recognized that i cared too much and that I would have regret leaving the classroom that I wasn't quite ready. I hadn't accomplished what I wanted to. And in the same boat, there's been a lot of great things that have, have happened because I didn't make that jump. And I'm sure I would I would have been successful as you would have been successful at that time. But our, our story in that grade level or in that position wasn't written yet. And if you can come around, I agonized about that situation and did I make the right decision or not. It, once the school year started, it didn't take me much time to recognize I made the right decision. The moment that you get in front of kids and you're like, this is what we're doing, and this, you, you get amped up, you get powered up, you get juiced up, and, and you put the performance face on, it, it answers the question for you. So um, it's, it's an awesome conversation, and I think – that I really, and I and I kind of share this early on, like it's something that I like to be an optimist and I like to uh, negate hard conversations, um, even though there are plenty of hard features of education as well as advocacy that we as teachers need to do, um, whether that's of our own time or families, community, school, et cetera. Hi, Casey. Welcome to the Powered Up Podcast. How are you doing today? Ken, I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much for having me on this opportunity. Absolutely. We're really excited to, to dig into some conversation with you. So to kick things off, please officially introduce yourself. Tell our audience where you're coming from and just what your, your journey in education has looked like so far. Awesome. So I'm coming to you live from my parents' house in Buffalo, New York where uh, I'm visiting them. Uh, normally I'm based out of Albany, New York, where I actually have an, a home as an adult. Uh, recently <laughs> finished a PhD in Ed Policy and Leadership Studies, where I looked at rural education. Um, I also have had the pleasure of writing a book called Thinking About Teaching, as well as uh, I have another one coming out from Edgematch Publishing as well called The Cog in the Machine. I have had a 20 year career in education between K-12 and higher education where I've mostly focused in on civics, civics engagement and teaching social studies. So that's one of the cool things that I've done for my career. Can you explain the difference between teaching civics, civics engagement, and social studies? Oh, absolutely. So social studies is an umbrella term that takes into our lives all different sorts of actual disciplines. History, geography, economics, sociology, anthropology, and civics. What civic participation is, is it's the idea of being engaged and involved in your day-to-day -day community, your day-to-day -day county, your day-to-day -day state, and the nation. And it's also something that's really interesting, and this ties in with civic uh, education as well, is that if we don't teach people how to understand literacy, if we don't teach people how government works, if we don't teach people about how they can participate, then we're going to lose our democracy, small d democracy. And I think that this is something critical is that there was recently a, a, a really poorly written letter that attacked kindergarten teachers. And this person said, well, I'm a college professor. I should make more than a kindergarten teacher. And my thought is you do not have to wipe bodily fluids off your students. Sit down, be quiet and maybe like show some respect to the to the people who are doing the hard work out there. Um, I also heard a really scary statistic that said that most people don't understand why their vote matters. Eek. Well, if you don't understand why your vote matters, then why are you voting on those TV programs that ask you to call the number 
or why are you texting in for your favorite contestant on a horrible game show, right? We need to learn how to participate better. We need to learn how to communicate that better. And we've got to stop taking students who are so passionate about learning and enjoy life and beating that out of them, either through our actions or through our methods, until they get into the college classroom and they're like, yo, peace out. I just want a piece of paper to make more money. Yeah, man, oh man, are you nailing just the the core value of honestly what we're all about. And when Ken and I get to sit down and have conversations where I feel like sometimes we don't understand or clarify the why, um, we focus more on the how and just how do we get kids engaged? How do we get kind of unlock creativity, those type things, which are valuable conversations. But it seems like your passion leans into the why, and that sets the purpose for everything else, which is really pretty dynamic. Because I'm going to be honest, we're going to lead into this conversation that makes me feel fairly uncomfortable because I'm going to sit here and say that I have some uh, similarities to what you mentioned of I kind of go through the motions and I am not as invested um, into all of the workings. And a lot of that is just because I'm not, I haven't invested the time to know what to do or had the right conversations to really set values related to it. Um, so I'm very, very much looking forward to this conversation. Well, Matt, first I want us to, to pause for a second because you said something that was profoundly self-revealing. Um, I wrote a chapter in my book, Thinking About Teaching from Edge of Match, where I talked about why I burned out and left as a high school teacher. And it was because I could not do the day-to-day -day that was necessary to help my students. And I got to that point in time in my, my very young career, five years in, where I said, eek, this is not doing justice for those kids that are in the seat. But you know what the scary thing is? Even though I thought I was mailing it in and I thought I wasn't doing great, the scary part of the world is when they hit you up on Facebook or LinkedIn or you run into them and they say, hey, Mr. J, I remember that lesson you did, the one where you brought in those mangoes and those blueberries and all of that crazy stuff for the Colombian exchange. But most important, I, I remember you asked me if I was okay after... I had had trouble because my family was going through an emergency. Or I have a student right now who um, I went into an interview because I'm looking for work and she was sitting there and I was like, oh my God, Marie, you're sitting there competing for an assistant superintendent position. And she went, oh my God, Mr. J, you were the only teacher who said even though I was 15 and had a baby, I had a future. And you think about it and you're like, Okay, so if I was only running on half gas then, whoa, because it, it gets you right in your heart that you made that much of a difference. So please don't be so hard on yourself, Matt. We are in a profession where um, if they had Teacher Appreciation Day at Duncan, you would see the draggled look on most educators' faces because they walk into a classroom every day, day in and day out for 180 some odd days. And they are there protecting those students from the world. They're teaching those students, but most importantly, they're putting themselves aside to be there for those students. What advice would you have for a, I, I wanna break this down into multiple uh, demographics by length of career. So let's start with, teacher year between two and five, and they're feeling that burnout. What advice do you have for them to let just to get out of that? And, and that could be what can they do themselves? And what else can they do to lean into their colleagues and administrators? Great question, Ken. Absolutely. Because here's where the issue lies. If you are a second or a third or a fourth year teacher and you're in your 20s, you are feeling burning because you have not had the stamina that a career builds and you've got to ask for help. You also don't 
have to invent the universe. One of the biggest flaws I see in teacher education is that we don't teach folks how to go and use resources. We say, oh, you need to be the creator or the progenitor of these amazing programs. But good Lord, 180 days of being a theatrical superstar on the length of Wicked, just you ain't going to be able to defy gravity like Alphaba said. You're going to crash and burn because it's exhausting. If you're in the second or third or fourth year of your career and you're an older person, you got to dig deep and you got to understand that you've got to go to your mental happy place. You need to take a break. You need to bite the bullet and put a sub plan in and get your butt out of there and go sit in front of a lake or go read a book or go throw an ax or you've got to go hang out with the beer.edu guys who do a great podcast in addition to yours where they talk about slowing down. And I think one of the powerful things, though, is that folks who are listening to the Powered Ed Up podcast here with us, you guys are getting some of the, the best professional development I have heard in my career. You need to understand now with podcasts, with Twitter, you don't need to wait for somebody to send you. You get it now. And this leads me into, I'm sure where you're going to go about what do you do with a mid-career teacher? Get, you got to just say to yourself, I cannot be perfect. I have to do better, but I also have to watch out for my younger colleagues who have never been through this before. Because unfortunately, we hear Jaws noises in the background. Why? Because for most school districts, they don't want to invest in young teachers. They want to turn them over. Keeps costs down, number one. Number two, a lot of the folks who are in administrative positions, I will not call them leaders. They're managers, and they're looking out for their own careers. You've got to pay attention when you hear that shark noise in the background, and what you've got to do is you got to knock on your colleague's door and say, hey, if you didn't bring your A-game today, bring your A-game. The principal's on the loose. And if you're a senior teacher, if you're a veteran teacher, you are at the end. You don't wake up in the morning and go, I am going to help save a child's life today. I am going to make somebody's career today. I am going to do my level best because I am there and I am excited and I am enthusiastic. Then go back to bed and retire early. I'll tell you something. I worked with a phenomenal gentleman by the name of Al Long. He was my teacher mentor at Sydney in history. Al, to the last day he taught, was on his feet in front of the class performing a Ronald Reagan sound alike. Well, Nancy, we got to have those jelly beans because of Gorbachev. <clears throat> and you know what happened? All of his students not only passed the U.S. History Regents exam, but they went on to college and kicked those U.S. one and two butts because Al was there for them. And you know who else Al was there for? Me. The kid who thought, oh, my God, I don't know how to do this. And he said to me, Casey, I believe in you. I want you to take over my advanced placement class. Can you believe that being a third year teacher and being told by your mentor and one of the region's best teachers, you get to go to Syracuse University. You get to learn how to do advanced placement. And I trust my legacy to you. It was enough to make my heart just absolutely go. I will run through a wall for you, Mr. Long. I will run through a wall. Uh, that just resonates. And Ken, I'm sure you have a scenario, right? Like we all have that. I mean, I'm going into my 13th year of teaching and there's no way that I would not, it would have gotten to this point or anywhere close if it weren't for a very select few that reached out. Um, and... I can think of one, uh, Marie Johnston, who was literally the world. She was like, she kept the school going when no one else could. Um, and she recently retired. But when I thought I was trying hard enough and putting my energy into the right thing, she would gently shift my perspective and readjust it and ask those tough questions and shoot the 
the point honest, but with care. And without her, unfortunately, what you're saying is far too true. I would not be sitting on the other side of the screen talking education right now. Um, it's an, it's incredibly accurate and, and disheartening by all means. I, I think there's an element of, uh, of challenge and we're almost talking about something that we're all collectively a little scared to talk about. And that's the reality behind education. And it's not meant to be cutthroat and it's not meant to be um, unkind, but I actually have a, a more recent example where it just seems like teachers coming out, and maybe this is just me, since I'm only going through like the second or third phase of working with newer teachers, really have this competitive nature instead of a collaborative nature in education. And that is a dangerous place where it's my coworker is trying to show me up instead of us putting our heads together and really creating something beautiful. That being said, the places that are doing the best thing for kids are still prioritizing collaboration, still prioritizing yes. putting everyone into the right position. And you can easily see by a few minutes into a building whether or not that is embraced or this, this newer unfortunate wave is, is there. Ken, do you have a, a scenario similar to that? I do. And, and honestly, a very um, little bit opposite of you and uh, to bring some more positive light to something that's not so common. Honestly, one of my biggest supporters in not burning out was my principal that uh, started in my school my second year. And I was his I was his guinea pig in terms of every new initiative went usually went to me. And it's because the first day I met him. I said, hi, my name is Ken. Anything that is related to technology that you want to try, you bring it to me and I'll figure it out because I was passionate about it, which for him was a huge spark because he was passionate about that. I knew that. And so, but it got to a point where I would come to him with ideas and he would say, that's a great idea. Who can do it? Because you're not doing it. He said, you're doing enough. You can't do any more or give something else up. And so he he put his you know his ego aside to make sure that i wasn't burning myself out because i was so passionate about constantly trying new things and so i was very fortunate to have someone looking out for me in that sense so casey if you're if you're a new teacher and you're you're seeking you're seeking out people that can support you in and we'll go with secondary that's where that's where you were and i think it serves as to be a more challenge Let's say your mentor teacher isn't, you know, they're great. They're, they're helping you. They're showing you the ropes, but they're not taking that extra step of looking out for you to, to prevent that burnout. Well, as a secondary teacher, especially high school, you're typically looking at your department and getting outside of your department happens much less. How do you, as a, as a secondary teacher, find colleagues that you think could potentially help you and support you um what questions do you ask them or how, like how do you how do you identify them because and and matt i'll i'll throw the elementary to you after after casey answers and how you think you do it in an elementary world you know ken you're asking a phenomenal question and matt i can't wait to hear from you about elementary because one of the areas i observed as as the district executive director for social studies in a large urban district where i oversaw k-12 was this, um, sometimes the departments weren't the right place to get the help. Sometimes you needed to go and talk to somebody who was even outside of your school, especially if you're in a large system, because um, partially I believe the lack of cooperation is being driven by the fact that the hiring process now is so competitive. Everybody was an A student coming out of college. Everybody has phenomenal lesson plans. So, you know, in the past, we could do a little bit of Oprah Winfrey. You get a job, you get a job, you get a job. And now it's like almost the Hunger Games. And what you need to do is you need to find your why, 
but also more importantly, you need to find somebody who isn't a person who may bump you out of your job if cuts happen. You need to find somebody who um, knows what you're dealing with. And I recommend your professional counsels locally. I recommend talking to people who are in other buildings in your department and say, hey, can we get together and just kind of chill for a little bit over maybe a glass of um, something that's poured <laughs> or maybe you need to pop the top on it a bit, you know? And just saying, hey, you know, I ran into this situation where I thought I did it right, but woo, did I miss it on the ball. What do you think? And they could go, you know, that happened to me about two years ago. And sometimes you just got to suck it up and eat it. You did it wrong. But other times they can come in and go, you know, I have passion. I have empathy. And not passion, compassion. Sorry, excuse me. Wrong word. And also... Go back and talk to the people you graduated with from college. They're probably going through the same exact thing you are. And, you know, I tried really hard to get a new teacher mentoring group going, but a lot of the districts said, well, why? We have mentors. Why should we provide them an opportunity to talk? And it was like, whoa, you need to, because teachers need safe psychological spaces. And I don't know about you guys, but in a lot of K-12 situations I've been in, it, it, it felt very much like there was an eye watching us. And, you know, and it's so awesome that you had a principal who helped you so much. I have had a lot of administrators who, for their own reasons, were looking to do something because they needed to prove how tough they were. And I think that that's a real bad flaw we have in the system. Administrators should not have to prove they're tough. Administrators should have to prove they're compassionate and they build and they scaffold and they create positive because it's just like discipline with students. What is the number one fault with classroom management or discipline? It's a negative approach. It should be classroom community building. The administrator, the principal, forgets the second part of their title, which is principal teacher. They are the ultimate teacher in the building. They have the knowledge, the skills, and the abilities. You know, and I think there's a lot of coaches out there who do instructional coaching who are phenomenal resources, but they may be handcuffed by the fact that we're only talking about literacy. Well, why are we only talking about literacy? Well, it's the district initiative. Ah, no, no, no. Professional development needs to be on point for teachers. It needs to be organic. It needs to be authentic. You need a coach not to come in and tell you how to do Baron Templeton, but you need a coach to come in and say, you know, wow, I'm just totally a mess. How do I take attendance so it doesn't eat up 20 minutes of my class? Or how do I do mini lessons that are engaging? That's what we need. We need authentic professional development and support. I think it's a really good point. And I think that there are definitely deficits and, and that commiseration. I mean, there is definitely a, I'll use that, that classic faculty room as a dangerous but almost addictive place because Teaching, as we have all mentioned, is an incredibly difficult, even on your best day, you feel like you made headway with 17 out of 18 kids, you could still have a perspective that you didn't reach that one out of 18. And so the idea of commiserating or the deadlines coming up or you have to do something extra is an incredibly negative headspace when you just feel like failure is where you live. Um, and that is something that I think we all have experienced. And it's one of those things that in education, we kind of come back to and cycle through far too often. I guess the, the challenge that I would have is to kind of spin this as how do we create this positivity? How do we create this even from a ground roots level? Because I'm not going, I'm not an administrator in this position that I could be Ken's mentor and I, I can care and support others as we've kind of already mentioned, 
but what other advice do you have that can help foster that if one or two or three people are opening their doors at times when other people need it, that we can create an environment that really reflects what we want education to be through the thick mud that we live through 180 plus days. Oh, you, you will just hit something on the head. And the advice is <clears throat> the sun will come out tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar. There will be sun. Orphan Annie was right. And part of it is, is educators, right? You know, we don't think about the fact that we are 93% successful. We think about the one student. But what we also need to think about is that every day is a new day and every trick in the book has its place. And you can, no matter what, turn somebody's life around. Even if for nine tenths of the year, the world is stinking, that tenth of the year, when you start talking about tanks that they saw on the History Channel, and all of a sudden they get a how did a technology influence history question on the Regents exam, and they knock it out of the park because all they did was just recount every single History Channel tanks in World War II show. They, that's all outside information. That's all using primary source documents. That's all like, whoa. And you go up to the kid and you fist bump him and you go, dude, you knocked it out of the park. And he said, because you thought I was smart enough to tell everybody about that TV program. And I think that also goes to our colleagues as well, because, you know, it, it's like it's you can see it. You walk in and out of classrooms and people are gripping their cups of coffee like it is a lifeline. But, you know, you see somebody who's up on a chair recounting Shakespeare or you see somebody who's talking about the Battle of Angincourt with arrows and they're wearing medieval garb and they're talking about yay verily or you've got the math teacher who's got the students going up and down and you know where that starts with that starts with one person walking in the door standing on the carpet in front of the office and going enough's enough this is going to be a better place to work i'm going to smile walking in and i'm going to drag people with me and that's what you do, because even if you're not in a titled position, we are all leaders. For many of us, most of us across the United States, we have graduate degrees. That means we are content experts. We can't create new knowledge necessarily because that's left for the big bangers who are at the university. But I guarantee you, I have seen teachers in the, the, the squishiest of circumstances do stuff to get their kids engaged. And when people let their egos go, and when they let that mm -mm go of the doldrums, and they bounce right in there, and they go, hey, today, BYOD, bring your own device day. I want you to Google whatever topic you want to, and then I want you to turn and share and pair, and I'm gonna go around the room, I'm going to put amazing things up on the board and we're going to stand up and we're going to talk to each other and chaos ensues in the classroom and the students are going to walk out and they're going to go, whoa, Mr. J was on fire today. And then Miss Olcott's going to come down and go, hey, Mr. J, I heard you knocked it out of the park today. And you'd be like, yes, Miss Olcott, because I put into place what you suggested. We've got to be team oriented, team function. And you know who's the best and brightest of lifting us up? Our students because they don't want us to suck. They want the best. And sometimes, sometimes, they'll be the only people who believe in you, especially when you don't believe in yourself. And to take that energy, to take those little ones that will run up to you and give you a hug, because I know elementary school teachers, you have just fan clubs from day <laughs> one, right, right? Our fan Absolutely. clubs, they think it's so uncool to be with us until they get into college. And then they're like, oh, my gosh, I want to be like Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so. That is the bestest thing in the world when the student runs up to you with clutching their parent's hand. And they go, mom, dad, grandma, aunt, uncle, I want you to meet Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so, my teacher. And especially if it happens in the supermarket, because that. That is the fire moment where you go, oh, my God, I mean a difference. 
And that's what we need. We need to remember that our profession is the only profession after the doctors who deliver babies that makes every other profession happen. And if it wasn't for the bus drivers and the cafeteria folks and the greeters and the people who help us, we are the only ecosystem that takes anybody that society gives us. And we will do our best. Because we are educators. Amen to that. Amen to that. Seriously. Absolutely. It's a great way to put it. And and uh, the uh, the fan club in the elementary world is real. It's uh, it's funny. I, I transitioned. I'm an instructional coach now for secondary for our secondary schools. And so after teaching fifth grade for eight years, all of my students are in middle school and high school. So I constantly see them in the hallway. I have great conversations with them. We like I can tell there's still a great level of respect and, and that they definitely um, enjoyed my classroom. But the fandom is gone. It's not uh, they're not running down the hallway screaming and yell, Mr. Ehrman, Mr. Ehrman. Whereas uh, my first position, this is total side tangent. My first position was teaching second grade uh, for a maternity leave. And I went back probably two months after my position ended subbing in the building. And the kids, so these little second graders, you know, they're seven years old, eight years old. They caught a glimpse of me in the building and they were literally chanting in the cafeteria my name until i walked in to see them uh so that was definitely the highlight of the of the uh elementary fandom but matt you still owe us an answer casey gave a great strategy for how to identify teachers to help support you outside of your direct mentor in preventing burnout and you need to do it from the elementary perspective before you share what other thoughts that you you were about to so i think I'll kind of merge what I was thinking as a response to what Casey was saying with your question. And I think the idea really comes down to finding joy. Whatever it takes to find joy is what you need to strive for. And when you are filled with joy, you attract others that find joy. And unfortunately, sometimes that may be a small population. Hopefully it's the majority, if not all of the building. And it may not be classroom teachers. It might be specialists. It may be the nurse. It may be the bus driver. It may be the cafeteria staff. But what I what I found is my responsibility as an elementary school teacher is to have very little pride or, I guess, self-identity that I care about. I am a character and I am a performer all day long. And that matters when I'm in front of a kindergarten class in the hallway when I see a sick kid heading to the nurse from sixth grade that I had two years ago, or if I'm actually in my classroom. And the reason I say that is it is so easy to find the negativity, as we were mentioning before, that having respect and having appreciation and kind of uh, ways to communicate with others that um, kind of display that is a really important thing. I'll use an example. So in supervision, uh, Danielson supervision, we have to do peer coaching. And I was very fortunate early on that I got the opportunity to work with a veteran teacher, Judy Howder, who literally like is the definition, if you can remember, hopefully she's not listening, uh, Mrs. Granger in Frindle, which is an Andrew Clement book that she is just lives by the dictionary, just very old school, the traditional teacher. And here I am three years out of college, really mucking my way through school. And she and I partnered up and it was the most beneficial thing. And from my perspective, I was like, I'm not providing anything to her. I am just absorbing everything that she is doing. And what she was receiving was energy and enthusiasm and creativity and these things that I felt were natural. What was natural to her was to be a curriculum expert. And so that wasn't out of her comfort zone. And so all that came through was me walking into that building and recognizing who was the most respected and trying to figure out how do I build a relationship? And 
maybe not discounting what I can bring to the table, but I ended up being the person when she had to change her password, she would come check check with me. If her smart board wasn't working, she would check with me before we even got to that point because I made myself willing and available to be that. And that took a relationship and changed it completely. And when she, when the rest of the staff started to see Judy and I working together, it opened doors for both of us. Our one-on-one -on -one meetings became three, four, or five people wide because everyone recognized that if we can all come together, I mean, at this point, I was roller skating around the building wearing like onesies to school. I was kind of doing the, the silly entertainment at assemblies. I wasn't valued in that school because of my professionalism yet that came afterwards. And that a huge part of that professionalism that avoided burnout, honestly, was my time with Judy or my time with Marie that narrowed down and said, hey, you need to make sure that when we're talking shop, you can still talk that too. Because I, I brought the energy, I brought all of that. And you don't have to do those things. You don't have to self-deprecate. You don't have to be these things. You just need to identify what are the relationships that would be beneficial for you to bridge. And saying hello, bringing coffee, um, offering support, those type conversations lead into being a resource, especially for young teachers, again, that don't feel like they have much to give. I don't know if that answers your question, Ken. It, but. it does. And to, to circle around two things that you both mentioned. So Matt, you mentioned about how the faculty room can be a very negative place. And those negative voices seem to be much louder. And Casey, you said one of your best resources is is the students. And for me, it, it definitely was. I After a few years, you know, in an elementary building, it ended at fifth grade. It was very easy for me to be the kid's favorite teacher as they left to go to middle school. I was the last teacher they had. Fifth grade's a fun year. Well, after a while, I started to hear the same name over and over again, their favorite teacher, Mrs. Holt's second grade. Well, for a second grade teacher to stick around as their favorite, that's a that's a not a red flag in a negative way. That's a that's a big you know, that's a big marker to me, like, okay, like, why is she their favorite? And then, you know, just starting to observe, learn and talk to her more and realize that she's their, their, she was their favorite, not just because she was caring, but because she was a phenomenal teacher. And so that was, like I said, like I said, you know, pointing out what you said, Casey, a big marker for me, the student's favorite teacher. That's a great way to find a teacher that can help you, especially someone that's been doing it for a long time and is still maintaining that status. Uh, that's a that's a huge piece for for finding a teacher that's going to support you in in your growth and and in staying positive and avoiding that burnout. So, Casey, you mentioned two of your books. Can you uh, give us the titles again and and give us a little bit of information about what they what they are? Sure. So the first one is called Thinking About Teaching. And what it does is it looks at um, some thoughts that I had that, believe it or not, started as blog posts about teaching, the environment, the world. And I spend uh, a number of short chapters that are readable in between uh, either a bathroom break or when the kid wakes, uh, puts down for a nap but wakes up or, you know, listening to it um, on, a, on, a, on an audio book as you're driving into work or even something that you can just pick up for 15 minutes to recenter, refocus. And I have a guiding question to each chapter. One of my favorite parts was um, I got to talk about how as a social studies teacher, we have the opportunity, especially in the rural school where I taught, to make a difference, to bring different viewpoints, to allow people to talk about what they're feeling. Our young folks these days are not hearing themselves in the conversations nationally, and they're becoming very disconcerted. They want to know why people who are supposed to be smarter than them or older than them or in charge or the more adult adult are not adulting. And I think part of the conversation that I have is that you've really got to have great role models. And my mom and dad are those role models. My father worked for the state doing inspection for asbestos control. My mother went into nursing homes to make sure that they were treating patients correctly. 
they told us no matter what you do be the best at what you do but no matter what be the ethicalist as you can do and as an eagle scout i bring very highly my ethical role that i bring to the table which is i'm still haunted by those students i couldn't reach i do hope that they are doing well Perry, if you're listening, I am so sorry that first year was a bad year for me, and I should not have been put in charge of a classroom at the ripe old age of 22. I really wish that we would have had more internship time, that we really would have had more experience. It's like telling a rookie doctor, go in and do life-performing brain surgery. It's that complicated to teach. We do almost a thousand decisions in a 40-minute period. My second book, also from Edge of Match, is called A Cog in the Machine. And what I do is I try to ground my career, not only where I came from, but where I'm going. And it gives a path to educators who could be wondering how to get into the field. It could be something for college students. Um, I highly recommend it for introduction to ed classes in the college. But also, I think, and this is something that one of my former students at college bought the book and gave it to his mom. And his mom reached out and said to me and said, you put on paper everything I was thinking about and everything I wished I had somebody to talk about to. And so part of the cog in the machine is really, it's this idea that you feel like you're getting ground up day in and day out. You feel like you're not making a difference. But at the end of the day, we did. We make a difference. We make a huge difference. And what I want people to walk away from when they read both of my books is that right now, a profession under siege that we are as educators is also the most critical and important professions in the world. And I want to share with you gentlemen why I wrote and I teach and I do what I do. When I was very young, when I was seven, a second grader, my youngest brother, Adam, became very ill. He was born because my mother was given medicine that should never have made it through the FDA approval. He was born without part of his heart, without part of his lungs, with no digestive system. He lived for three months. And I thought, my God, I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to help and I wanted to save people. And in 10th grade biology, I was partnered with Laura Schleylein, who is now a world-class pediatric oncologist. And I chucked all over her dress when I hit that frog with that scalpel. Laura still to this day reminds me about it. But I knew I wasn't going to be a blood and guts person, but I was going to help train people and I was going to help make the world a better place. And I got to do that with my engineering and computer science and physics and chemistry students at Rensselaer Polytechnical Institute when I taught leadership. And I would share to them, this is my why. I teach you these so that no other family will have to have a funeral. So that one of you will say, wait, stop. This isn't right. Or this does not make sense. We talk about the Challenger. We talk about the Columbia. Now we're talking about COVID-19 and 600,000 deaths. One thing that tyrant dictator of the Soviet Union said was one death is a tragedy. Millions are a statistic. The loss of my brother Adam haunts me to this day. But right now I've got 480 engineers who are looking at schematics who are reading documents, who are analyzing chemicals, and they're going, hey boss, this doesn't make sense. Because they were there to see me cry 30 years later about losing my little brother. And so I want people who hear this to know that no matter what you do, no matter what you have to do, remember one child makes all the difference in the world to one family. And even if we have a 93% success rate, what we need to do is we need to follow up to get that 7% success rate with that one student. And I'll tell you something, the system is not built for that.
So we individually have to take responsibility for that. And when we start to feel burned out, we have to tag in. We have to tag in. And that, my friends, is where you build your PLC or your PLN. You ask them, I cannot mentally do tomorrow. And they will come to your rescue by giving you a lesson plan that can be done like that. Or they will Skype into your class to talk to your students. Or their class will come over to your class and there will be a group activity. And they'll put their hand on your shoulder and they'll go, I'm in. I'll tag out when you're ready. Education is the only profession that truly has not gotten the message that teamwork is the dream work. And we need to stop thinking like we're eggs in an egg container. Our classrooms are not little boxes. They're a hive. And you all know this. A honeycomb or a hive is way stronger than one little area. Absolutely. And <clears throat> I love that analogy with the <clears throat> the egg carton, egg carton versus the beehive because it is so important. We have to move outside of our classroom walls as you said earlier, podcasts are a way to do that, attending conferences, building that network outside of your school, as well as, as strengthening what you have inside. And we really appreciate all the personal stories that you shared with us, uh, because that is that is so valuable in, in what we do. It's important for students to understand why we do what we do. And it's, it's important for us to understand the whys of students and the whys of, of families. And, and uh, my superintendent used that few years ago, just talking about, you know, remember that every child that walks into your room is somebody's why, you know, that's somebody's world. It's their child, whether or not they're the most involved or the least involved parent, there's reasoning behind it. There's more to it than that meets the eye. And we have to, we have to approach every situation with, with empathy and with understanding of that child, of the family and of ourselves, and, and just to try to do our best. And and you talked about, you know, 93% success rate, trying to pick up that other 7%. You know, just remember that you may be reaching a certain percentage and somebody else is reaching a different percentage. And, you know, we had, Matt and I had a, recently had a great conversation with an art teacher and she felt one of her best aspects of her position was she reached students that typically weren't reached because they opened up in different ways. And so you might not see that particular student open up in your room, but uh, they might be doing it in another room. And communicating with your team and ensuring of that is one of the best ways to make sure that somebody is reaching that, that student. It doesn't have to be you all the time. You can always be there for them and you can always be positive towards them, but you don't necessarily have to be the one that's, that's directly impacting that student the most or the best as long as somebody is. And so uh, I do want to transition looking at our time into our lesson lens to try to learn about something that you used to do in your classroom. Maybe you did it uh, in your time in college or we'll, we'll go back to, to your years teaching civics um, in high school. So wherever you want to take us with that is totally fine. So the first part is just telling us, are we looking at a single lesson, a long-term project, or a unit overview? It, it's a single lesson. If you were to... Um identify like grade level, maybe time of year that uh, this lesson would occur? Sure. I was working with seniors and it was spring semester and they had all gotten their acceptance letters to college or they knew they were going into the military or they were doing their thing and work. So they had, she checked out. <laughs> <laughs> so what were the objectives of the lesson? Number one, it was to get them to uh, participate in a full-scale riot of changing a rule in the school. And so the second objective was for them to full-scale riot without me getting fired. Um, and the third objective was to teach them the citizenship process. And so those were the three goals. <laughs> awesome. If you were to kind of identify uh, what the students actively did in the lesson, um, from beginning to end, what were some of those features that were really dynamic? Yeah, so the first thing the students did was they brainstormed what they hated about school and what they wish would change. 
second thing that they did was they identified the pathways that they could take you know go to the principal walk out of the classroom riot in the in the cafeteria or you know, i really shouldn't use that word riot um more of um, peacefully protest in the cafeteria walk out of the school um, and what they finally decided to do was go to a board of education meeting and ask why they were not allowed to eat and drink in the classrooms because what they felt was this they had and this is where i'm super proud of them they had a couple of students who were diabetics and the diabetic students always felt uncomfortable eating or drinking even though they were allowed to and so what the students wanted to also let the administration know was with the way the lunch periods were broken up because we we're a very small school we only had about 400 students in it um, quite often students were not getting a good amount of time to eat lunch or they were eating lunch so late in the afternoon to accommodate the middle school students that um, they were getting a little hungry. So one of the things that I did as a teacher was I kept my mouth shut because I wasn't an experienced teacher, but I asked five senior teachers total, four in my department, and then a special ed teacher who is my ever to this day loving mentor, shout out to Nancy Hinckley for just Oh, the rescues she's done for students and for adults uh, in their careers. And she worked with the toughest students who needed the most help in special ed, by the way. Nancy and the four teachers said, yeah, we're fine. No worries. Just kids can eat or drink in our classroom. What really became the effort was to find out why they weren't allowed to eat or drink in the classroom. Come to find out the building had a problem with insects. And so if you left food in the classroom, insects would come in. So what we did was we established classrooms that were, uh, that people could eat in, or we identified spaces that students could eat in and allow them to utilize study halls as the opportunity to eat or drink. Um, I also made it a rule that in my classroom that if you're hungry, you had to eat. If you were thirsty, you had to drink. And if you had to go to the bathroom, please don't ask permission because the college professor is gonna be annoyed at you for doing that. Plus your job supervisor is gonna hate you if you go, can I go to the bathroom, right? So uh, at the end of the day, what the students learned was if they can't get an overall global change, they can start slowly chipping away at it. And one of the points that I thought was absolutely phenomenal was they dragged the biology teacher into this. About what type of insects were most commonly attracted to the foods that the cafeteria was selling? And come to find out all of the insects were attracted to all of the food because it was all carb rich snacks. And what they asked was what if they changed to fruit snacks? Would that limit the type of insects coming in? It wouldn't, but dang, they really did their research. They really went deep. And you know what was really awesome to see? It was really awesome to see two of them go on to animal study schools to kind of think about like researching with animals. And they used that civics project and that work with the biology teacher as their admissions essay for school. That's awesome. So you, you kind of alluded to uh, your role in that and, and guiding them, supporting them, challenging them to ask questions. Uh, so you, you kind of already answered my question. So the last one is, what advice would you have for yourself if tomorrow you were going to teach her this lesson again? Don't be afraid of the consequences as an educator. Be more afraid that we're not teaching students how to civically engage and actively say to authority figures, I don't agree with you. I'm not going to disobey you, but I'm going to do everything in my power to ensure that you understand that this is a bum rule and needs to change. Because this is, I think, one of the areas that we often forget about in education and specifically civics, is we are training folks on an age old 19th century model of compliance. 
our students need to be able to Google and they need to go on the web and create knowledge that I have no knowledge of because their careers in two, three, four, five, ten years are going to light speed past mine. I guarantee you there are a bunch of kids out there who love Star Trek and Star Wars and they want to create a tractor beam or not a tractor beam but a transporter and they also want to create warp speed and they're working on it. They're working on it. I know I've got two students who are at the Jet Propulsion Lab right now. They're trying to figure out how to take Mars dust and make it into an edible cookie. They're not stupid. They want the 23rd and a half century to get here mighty quick. So we got to coach them on how to learn, not what to learn, but how to learn. Absolutely. That's a, that's awesome. That's a, that's, I, I always enjoy teaching social studies and setting up simulations. So I, it's really cool that you set up that simulation. I think you timed it perfectly with, like you said, senioritis was in full swing, but you were tapping into their experience of being in the school so long. So that was that was neat. I, I enjoyed that. So our last section of the show is our exit ticket. Same four questions we ask every guest every week. Question number one, what is the best thing a teacher can do to make a student's school experience better? Know them by name. <laughs> 100%. Number one. Number one, know them by name. Gosh, it sounds so simple, but it makes a huge, huge difference. Back to basics, baby. Back to basics. Absolutely. Um, I know you've mentioned plenty of advice, but is there something specific um, that you've gotten from a colleague, a, a supervisor, or a student that has stuck with you that you'd like to share with the audience? Absolutely. When Linnea Nordberg said to me when I was getting divorced, not on my part, but my ex-wife left me, and she said, Mr. J, we're here for you, but please take care of yourself. Please go talk to somebody. My God, I saw a 48-year-old vice president of a company standing before me when she was 15. And, you know, you think about it and you're like, you're right. Folks, we got to be okay with getting mental health. Our mental health shattered this past year. We were holding on by our fingernails before that, but it took a pandemic for the balloon, the glass balloon to shatter. Get help. Please get help if you need it. Absolutely. It's so important. We can't take care of the kids in front of us if we can't take care of ourselves, and it's, it's, it's so, so important. So you've, you've actually sp you, you've spoken to this question a lot tonight, so I'm going to challenge you to kind of take a lot of the the wisdom that you shared with us and try to boil it down to like one sentence or one phrase that everybody's <laughs> going to remember you by because we've circled around this question all night in a good way so the school year goes in waves and there are stressful moments around conferences report cards when that the to-do list is piling up on top of us outside of still our daily lesson plans what is one thing that you can say to an educator in that moment to help them power up Without you, there is no tomorrow. And I think people need to say this to themselves. Without me, there is no tomorrow. But I would say this to an educator. I would look them in the face. I would get really close and I would go, without you, there is no tomorrow. I believe in you. That is powerful beyond belief. I'm hearing it in, in the middle of summer, and boy, it's hidden. I, it's, it's definitely something I need to hear during the school year multiple times. You have done an incredible job of kind of pulling both self-care and challenge and concern and, and support. Um, and one of the things we would love to do is extend the conversation further. So um, obviously you mentioned uh, that you're a published author, but what are the best ways that the audience can get in contact with you in the future? Twitter, at KCJ underscore EDU. I'm always tweeting. I put uh, links to my blog posts. Uh, I, I do LinkedIn, but I also do, uh, and the Facebook platforms, I all do that through Twitter. 
I utilize Twitter as my central location. Plus, if you try to Google my name, oh my lord, nobody gets Jacobowski right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and and you know the parting shot for the for the conversation is this, and we do need to talk about it. Um, we have a crucial moment in time where, as educators, we cannot allow the narrative to be co-opted by others. We need to take the narrative back. If people think you're a glorified overpaid babysitter show them what lesson planning involves. If somebody thinks that you're, you have no clue what you're doing, so you teach, right? Though those who do, uh, those who can do, those who can't teach, no, invite them to see the level of math that you are doing in the middle school. I mean, oh my God, math should not have that many letters in the middle school, you know? <laughs> Scientists. Yeah right? Rocketry in fourth grade. We're teaching the fundamentals of trigonometry and rocketry in fourth grade in the United States. Eek! Take that narrative back. Don't let people tell you you're not a professional. You are. And also, more importantly, and this is the most critical thing I want people to remember walking away besides change that narrative, is stop booing yourself off the stage before you even arrive. End that mental imposter syndrome narrative because dang it, ladies and gentlemen out there in, in, in the, the powered up world, you are the requirement for the future. Without you, there is no future. I believe in you. Hmm. What a great closing. There's there's nothing for me to add except to, to say 100% I agree. Uh, you know, taking that narrative, like you said, use social media, use our powered up website platform to share what you do. Uh, tell tell your story, share pictures, share lessons. You know, the more the more you tell, the more people are able to see that and understand exactly what we do on a daily basis. Casey, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, you have left soundbite after soundbite of inspiration and motivation. Uh, this was this was a lot of fun for Matt and I. It definitely helping us power up as we uh, get ready to recharge for the next school year. Uh, if you want to check out Casey's books as well as his uh, website and his social media handles, I will link all of that in our show notes page, which can be found at powereduup.com slash show31. And everything will be linked there for you to check out. Casey, thanks again. And Matt, why don't you uh, power down for us? Yeah, so as we power down, Casey, you have left us feeling powered up. Um, please take some of the things that you heard today um, with you, whether you're listening to this in the summer, right before the school year. The beginning of the year is going to be hectic. Take time for yourself. Simplify where you can and, and reach out. Uh, reach out for the support internally and externally um, because it's a tough but incredibly important conversation. So stay well. Uh, hopefully all is ha happy, healthy, and, and good, and we will talk to you guys next week. Thank you again, Case.